Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. I am so excited because today we have Dr. Nancy Snyderman. And I know you've all seen her. She's that wonderful health guru on NBC. She's on the Today Show and all over NBC. Well, I know you've seen her because you've sent in a million questions. You know, everybody thinks you know everything. Well, let's see. So we may stump you today. <laughs> this will be the stump by Marlo segment. <laughs> It's not by me. I don't know enough to even ask. But these are really great questions. So um, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Our community's there. The first one's from Sharon. Hello, Sharon. Hi. I'm wondering if certain foods or vitamins can affect your mood. Are there foods that can help relieve depression? I don't know that there are foods that for everybody work the same way, but we do know that foods that have a lot of color in them, a lot of the peppers and broccoli, the perfect food, can absolutely help alleviate mood. And I would suggest to anybody that foods are a better source to elevate your mood than trying to get vitamins out of a bottle. That I know doesn't oh, really? work so well, right? Uh -huh. You're much better to get through food. So the kinds of foods that can mood elevate, dark chocolate, for sure. Oh, really? Fatty fishes like salmon and dark colored fruits and vegetables. Oh, really? Those are the best. And what, the Mediterranean how, diet. And how does sugar affect you? Well, not everybody gets affected the same way. You know, the average American eats 21 teaspoons of sugar a day. Oh, my God. Far more than he or she right, needs. Good. So for some people, they feel they get that sort of sugar bump right. and then they crash afterwards. Right. If you're one of those people who finds that you have no energy after lunch, chart what you've had. Most likely you've had sugar, it's bumped up your energy, and then you plunge about four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, that's so great. That's so good to know. Okay, this is from Valerie, and she wants to know, what do women that are 40 plus need to know about breast and ovarian cancer screenings? Could you offer a checklist? So most breast and ovarian cancer, the number one risk factor is age. So the older you get, the more likely is you're going to have the risk of getting those. But really, I thought age I th the number one risk factor. Oh, I thought it would decrease as you got older. No, it gets it increases as you get older. Oh, no. So if you take a hundred hundred year old women, they'll all have breast cancer. So when you hear about this one in eight number, it's not one in eight 29 year olds. It's one in eight women throughout the whole course of their lives. Uh -huh. So. Here's where the controversy comes in. We've always learned that you get your annual mammogram and that's what's gonna save your life. Right. But a government panel a couple of years ago said that there's really no reason to screen women until they're 50. A lot of us, including, I'm sure you and I are the same, right. started routine mammography around oh, yeah. the age of 40. Right. The reason that happened is because the 40 year old breast is dense and it's hard for mammography to really look oh. thoroughly. So there are a lot more of what we call false positives. So rule of thumb, 50 and over, you have to have a routine screening every test year. every year. And if you have a history of breast cancer or you've been on hormone replacement therapy, dad, uncle's dad, grandfather with prostate cancer, a family history littered with cancer, you might wanna start screening early. For ovarian cancer, the best screening is still a pelvic exam. A pelvic exam. Mm -hmm. Or a sonogram, right? Ultrasound, yeah. Vaginal right. ultrasound also works. Right. And then there's an ultrasound for the breast as well as a mammogram. Do so, you suggest both? You know, it's interesting. Mammography is still sort of the, the, the gold standard. Right. But depending on what kind of lump is seen, a doctor may recommend maybe sometimes an MRI or an ultrasound. An ultrasound is going to tell if that lump in your breast is dense or if it has fluid in it. And that gives doctors a good idea as to whether a biopsy is well, needed or not. Well, I don't have any lumps in my breast, but the place where I have the breast, the mammogram, they always also have a sonogram. And that's probably because over and over and over again, you've got the same spot that looks suspicious, so they're doing a backup test just to see. Good, I'm glad. Okay, you got your answer. <laughs> this is from Danielle. What are five things you can do to maintain healthy eyes and vision? Carrots, carrots, carrots. Really? <laughs> and, and good genes. <laughs> So here are the things that don't hurt your eyes. Reading in the dark does not hurt your eyes. All those sort of old wives' tales you heard as a kid. Right. Squinting does not hurt your eyes. Interestingly, most eye problems come from just family history. You're either born with eyes that are gonna need correction early on, fifth and sixth grade, or as you get older, you're going to need reading glasses. Um, so most vision problems are just part of your family tree. So, but but carrots, diet can help. Carrots can help. Yeah, Anything yeah. else in the but diet? Now, but you know, interestingly, vitamin A, which is the vitamin in carrots, it's the one vitamin that if you take too much of, it's toxic. 
So vitamin A is not something I would take so out of vitamin. So how much do you want to take? You just eat a good diet. You're going to be fine. Yeah. Now, what about uh, sunglasses? I read somewhere that ah. if you don't wear sunglasses, you can get molecular or macular degeneration. And cataracts. So well, I'm a big believer that even on a day with clouds, uh -huh. I wear sunglasses every single day. Okay. So that's the one real take home. Um, so if we want five things. For, for so vision, carrots. carrots uh, sunglasses, 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 <laughs> and know your family history. Okay, all right. But really, cataracts are the one thing that we know increase with aging, and that's UV light. And UV light causes that thickening of the eye. So if you want to avoid it, wear sunglasses. Okay, we got it. This is from Lisa. I had a hysterectomy two years ago, and I haven't been on any hormone medicine yet. Is that okay? Well, Lisa, it depends on how old you are. If you're over the age of 50 and you've sort of gone through your perimenopausal time and you've had a hysterectomy, it doesn't really matter if you're on hormones. But if you had a hysterectomy at 25, 30, or 35, and your body hasn't had sort of the normal amount of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone that a, a woman otherwise would have, that's when you talk to your doctor about a course of hormone replacement therapy. Now, you're going to get some controversy over this, but I'm one of those people who doesn't believe in long-term hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women because I believe there is a significant link to breast I've cancer. I've never taken it. Me either, I've and I just wouldn't it. do it. I just sort of did it the old fashioned right, way. Right. And you know, you and I are good examples. You get your brain back, right. your skin survives. Right. You, you know, it's well, okay. Well, I just do everything else. It's not a disease. That's right. It's I a do, stage yeah. in life. But I take care of everything else. I, yeah, but you exercise, right. you don't smoke. You wait, you, you wait, wait, no smoking. Very important. Right. And there's all kinds of stuff at the health store, like, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, fish oil. Pr primrose oil. Yeah, primrose. Primrose oil, uh, and, fish oil. And you know the best thing you can do if you're having n night sweats? It, there's some controversy as to which uh, over-the-counter stuff you can get the health food store will help. The best thing to do is buy really smart clothing. Don't sleep in nightgowns or flannel PJs. Sleep in exercise clothing because that wicks the moisture right. away. Yeah. And you won't find your wound ripping off your, right. your sheets all you the time. You may ruin your sex life. Your husband may That's not right. like it. But, but, so. You know, you might wake up naked and you'll think, you know, something <laughs> great <right>. happened. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Margaret. Is there any way women can increase their chances of being fertile in their late 30s? Oh, this is a good well, question. Well, this is what everybody sort of doesn't want to hear. You know, Mother Nature created us to do certain things at different stages. And so our peak fertile years are in our 20s. Mm -hmm. And that's because our eggs are healthier and mm -hmm. we're going to be more robust and around to have our kids and our grandkids. But if you haven't had children, and a lot of us didn't have kids until our 30s, I'm one of those people, if you find that, you know, it's harder and harder um, to sort of deal with your fertility, just know this. Infertility is diagnosed as unprotected sex for one year with no pregnancy. If that's happened to you, then it's time to go see a good reproductive doctor because there are hormones and good drugs that under a doctor's guidance you can go on. But there aren't any foods or supplements? No, no. Okay. This is purely hormonal. Okay, all right. This is from Marcy. There's an alarming wave of self-injury, self-cutting in children today. What should parents know about this and how can they stop it? It is alarming, rips your heart out, and when it happens and you don't see it coming, I'm telling you, I've, more parents have said to me, I never saw the warning signs. What is so the, the warning, warning signs? So the warning signs sort of go along with depression. If your child is suddenly in his or her bedroom, more than not, on the computer, new friends, grades have suffered, not wanting to spend so much time at the dinner table, um, not wanting to be on the sports team anymore, suddenly girls wearing long sleeves or a lot of jangly bracelets, not dressing the way kids did before. And remember, boys are cutters sometimes too, okay. although girls more, more. Watch for any way that your child is dressing uh, differently. And if that happens, I mean, there are a couple of different things you can do, but confronting your child in a loving way is number one with a backup plan. And that means a therapist, a school counselor, favorite can teacher, you just ask priest. A child, can you say, oh, you, you're not involved in this? I would thing. just say, sweetie pie, what's going on? Right. I've noticed that this is going on. And you know what? You must be hurting in a way that I'm not sure I can help you, but I'm here for you. Let's right. go get someone to talk to right. and then go with your child. Right. It's not time to recriminate or punish. No, no. This is a try time to say, I know you're hurting on a really deep well, level. Well, that's why kids don't say things, so they're afraid they're going to get punished. That's right. So don't yeah. punish them further. Help them. Right. Help them. Uh, this is from Terry. Hi, Terry. Is there a danger in taking too many vitamins? If so, what can happen to your system and how do you know what is the right amount? So here's the thing. Vitamins are supplements. 
Supplement means it fills in the foods you're not getting. Right. In a perfect world, I would love you to eat enough fruits and vegetables and fish and almonds so that you get enough of everything. But if you don't eat a good diet, then figure out what you're not getting. Are you not getting enough vitamin C, maybe the B vitamins? Recently, there's been pretty good evidence that calcium and vitamin D do not prevent osteoporosis in premenopausal women. And I think a lot of times people think if they just go take pills, they can avoid eating right, good foods. Right. And then frankly, your body only absorbs what it needs and you just get expensive urine. Uh, so <laughs> I would say, exactly. So I would say overall, the bottles are meant for when you really are off track. Try to eat good stuff. And not every day is going to be perfect. Um, but there are some vitamins that aren't going to do you good. I don't take calcium anymore because really? I think it could hurt my heart. I don't think it's going to make my bones stronger. The weight-bearing exercise is better. Yeah. I take vitamin D. Vitamin D may help you. you can't hurt that? you. I do take vitamin D because I don't think we get take? enough sunshine. 2,000 units. One of those little pills a day. I take 2,000 too. Yeah, but weight-bearing exercise is going to serve oh, yeah, you and I me do. better than anything. Absolutely. And vitamin A is toxic yep. in big doses. So right. be smart. And remember, the person in that health food store may have been selling tires the week before. You don't that. know that person is smart. You're probably smarter. He's not a pharmacist. <laughs> no. Right. That's great. And most doctors don't take a lot, so take that to heart. I know. I know. Well, they don't believe in anything. <laughs> this is from Stephen. I'm a 46-year-old male. When is the best age to start having colonoscopies? There isn't any colon cancer in my family. You're 50 is the time to get your first screening test. And then if you're, if you're normal, Stephen, and because there's no colon cancer in your family, every 10 years is probably enough. If there is colon cancer in your family, then you adjust accordingly. And then you, there is colon cancer in my family. So I get a colonoscopy every three years. But that's because my grandfather died of it. My father got it. I've already had a few abnormal colonoscopies. So I just accordingly and that's what I think personalized medicine right, is all right. about yeah you have to know your own risk factors both no risk factors for men and women it's 50 right good well that's good this is from Gary what are some tips for a good night's sleep and how much is enough well I'm, so, I'm in eight hours me too but yeah. that's why you yeah. look so good <laughs> <laughs> so number one get your television out of your bedroom beds are meant for sex and sleeping that's it Yes, it and is. that that's it. So if you get all your electronics and your television out, you'll start to sleep better. And then pick the same time, weekdays and weeknights and go to bed. It's all about sleep hygiene. There's there is even some cool apps now you can put on your phone so you can put your phone under your pillow oh, really? and it can tell when you start to awaken and it can tell that if you start to awaken earlier than you normally get up, it says get up, get up, you're done and you can start to adjust. Before we had lights, wow. we went to bed when the moon right. came up, right. and we got up when the sun came up. Right. If we did that more often, we'd be better off. Well, he says how much is enough. So Most people, seven to eight. Seven to but eight. the difference may be for some people, you know, six for some people, but if you talk to anybody and they say three to four, not no, true. Can't you, can't, you can't get by no, on five no, to no, six. No, no, no. Seven to eight. Yeah. Uh, this is from Barbara. So many children are suffering from the effects of bullying. Some are even committing suicide. What can a parent do to protect their child? Well, I think you have to say there's zero tolerance. And it's zero tolerance whether you hear that your child's the bullier or if your child is being bullied and there has to be a safe place to go. I had a daughter who was uh, bullied and I was stunned. I called the three boys' parents who were roughing up my daughter and I was stunned at the response of the parents. One mother denied it. One mother was apathetic, and one mother stepped up to the plate and did the right thing. Really? So a lot of times, you as a parent, you have to be the real bulldog and right. insert yourself in your child's life. And that can be embarrassing for your child, but this is for school principals, teachers, right. other parents. This is an epidemic in this right, country. Right. Enough. So, so the parents Enough. should take charge. Yeah. I, I Who's going to defend your child if you don't? Right. How old was your daughter when that happened? Sixth grade. Wow. Classic. Wow. Classic. Um, and it was boys. Boys. Because usually it's girls. And girls on girls and boys on boys. Yeah. But these were the tough boys. They wanted mm. to make a statement. Oh, so guess what? What? They got a statement. From mom. <laughs> mom gave the statement. They stepped in. <laughs> This is from Carolyn. Oh, what do you think about vitamin D and calcium? We've kind of said that. Yeah, so you know, Carolyn, this, I'm, I want you to know, Carolyn, I think the jury is out on vitamin D and calcium. Government studies said there's no proof that vitamin D and calcium in regular doses in premenopausal women protects against bones weakening. So the best thing to do is weight-bearing exercise, get your vitamin D and milk, 
You can take your vitamin D on the side if you want to. I'm a little concerned the calcium may be linked to heart problems right now. So a good reminder, walking, anything that puts you against gravity right. makes your bones stronger. And as you said, lifting weights, uh -huh. if you make your bones, if you make your muscles stronger, your bones have to be stronger to hold those muscles right. together. So it's a win-win situation. So there's kale. Yep. It's got kale. All the green leafy vegetables yeah. are good. So that's good. That's yeah. a good thing. All the green do. leafy yeah. vegetables. Broccoli then, is the perfect food. Yeah. I don't I can't eat dairy, so I am always eating those yeah. other things. Uh, are, this is from Cody. Are there exercises you can do for your eyes? Oh, are there? That'd be great. No. 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 The only exercises you can do for your eyes are if you're a baby and you have, you know, this muscle problem that causes a wandering eye. And then some doc sometimes doctors will patch the good eye to make the lazy eye work harder. But for those of us who just have normal eyes and we have to wear glasses or contacts, there, there, are, no, there are no exercises. No exercises. Not How that you disappointing. Wish. I love anything to do with an exercise. It means I have control. <laughs> this is from Mike. What is the best way to cope with seasonal mm. allergies? A lot of people go straight for the medication, but is there something else I can do to cope with my allergies? So first of all, know which season you have your allergies. Sometimes for people, it's really um, grasses and trees in the spring, and it's hay fever and ragweed in, the aug in August. And in the dead of winter, it's molds because we close up our houses. If you like to exercise outside, and it's the height of pollen season, exercise in the morning while the pollen is still on the ground and still in oh, the cars. Good. By the time it's kicked up, you're going to breathe it. Uh -huh. um, if it's the dead of winter and you know you have mold in your house, take the summer months to scrub that house down so that by the time you close it up again, you've limited your mold. Uh, you really have to know what your triggers are. I don't think most of the over-the-counter medications work perfectly because they cause a lot of drowsiness. But if you really have allergies that nothing works, there are nasal steroids, a little squirt of a prescription medication, not addicting. The steroids are not absorbed in your in your body, perfectly safe, and they really work well, especially if you have runny eyes and, and a how, stuffy how nose. And how often could you use that? You can use them every single day. Really, a steroid? Mm -hmm. Because they're not the kind of bad steroid that you and I know about. Right. They, You'll it's, get an it's an a mist. Schwarzenegger nose. No. <laughs> <laughs> you just to keep, keep a Marlowe nose. Um, the steroid just gets deposited in the membranes in the nose. Uh -huh. causes all, it takes, all, makes all the symptoms of the allergy go away and you feel better. Oh, good. And sometimes allergy shots. But in some families, this is familial. And so if you have parents with allergies, you're more likely to have yeah, allergies. Yeah. This is from Sophie. The summer's coming and I'm dreading all the mosquito bites that I'm going to get. Is there anything that can prevent mosquito bites? And if I do get them, is there anything I can use on my bites to prevent them from swelling? I know people are afraid of this chemical, but DEET, D-E-E-T, is the best anti-mosquito um, repellent around. Why and are they afraid of because it? Because you know, some people think it's just too strong a chemical, but it works. And increasingly, even in the United States, we now have cases of encephalitis, brain inflammation, that can um, be a result of getting mosquito bites. So I'm a big believer in insect repellent. There are really good ones on the market. Read the label, but make sure it contains the compound DEET, D-E-E-T. That's the best stuff. What is, what is D-E-E-T? It is a non-toxic um, anti-insect repellent. So, so you mean not, not like off? Oh, indeed, is in off. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Is that your favorite? It's one of them. <laughs> it smells, but I. Yeah, see, they, they make them better but now. I don't care. They're I'll a little do more anything. perfumey. But look at that. This is just from yesterday sitting oh, outside. Yes. Look at they you. love me. All right, this is from Beth. I would love to hear your opinion on supplements that help women during menopause. I'm also interested in weight loss post menopause. It seems impossible. So. The good, the good news, bad news about menopause is not a disease, it's a stage in life and you get everything back. But as we get older, and we all think it's due to menopause, we lose some height because our, the cushions between our vertebrae get a little flatter. And what that happens, when we lose height, it has to go somewhere, and our waists get a little thicker. Oh, and we always a, blame it oh, on menopause. Oh, that's interesting. It's because you know, we lose about a uh -huh. half an inch in life. Right. I'm not a big believer in overly medicating for menopause because I think we've made it a disease. It's right. just a part of life. It's the anti-puberty. Um, 
right, in, right. in life. So but I we would, are losing things. We're losing certain oils. and you lo That's the biggest you know? thing. You lose moisture. Right. So you have to moisturize your skin right. more. You know, you're that's gonna find why your, fish oil is good, right? And, f and eating and fish. And I eat fish two or three times uh -huh. a week minimum, and I right. take fish oil. Right. But all the other stuff, I frankly would put it by the wayside. You know, I, even as a physician, I turn to physicians when I don't know what to do. And Dr. Susan Love, who's an amazing breast yeah, cancer surgeon, mm -hmm. and she's sort of my guru. She wrote, I think, the best book on menopause. Mm -hmm. And I've turned to her to say, what works, what doesn't? Right. And she says, you know, every day, we're sort of changing our minds because right. we're finding more and more women are trying things. Right. And a lot of stuff doesn't work. Right. Lifestyle is the best way to combat menopause. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a lot of that has to do with weights yes. and walking. Yep. Right. And do the weights uh, every day? I, four days. Four days a week. Four days a week. I did this morning, actually. This is from John. I'm African American, and I've always thought that I don't need to wear sunscreen, but my friends say that I should. Should I? John, listen to your friends. <laughs> Even people of color can get skin cancer, and malignant melanoma is the number one killer and an epidemic right now in the United States. So your pigment does protect you to some extent, but not completely. UVA and UVA rays will still penetrate your skin. Use sunscreen. Not only will it make your skin look really good, but people of color who get malignant melanoma have lousy outcomes. They oh, die. Really? They usually get more virulent cancers. Oh, my. So use it. Uh huh. I didn't realize yeah. that. Uh, this is from Vanessa. What's the most surprising thing most people don't know about their eyesight? I think you hit on it. Most people don't realize that sunglasses are protective. So this is the one time to invest in a decent piece of a fashion. <laughs> get something you love, but make sure you read the label carefully and it says that it filters and protects against UVA and UVB rays. Those are the ones that will come into your eyes and cause cataracts. Mm -hmm. And I think you can prevent cataracts from coming just by using sunglasses. Really? I wear them all the time. Huh. Jack you know, Nicholson was ahead of everybody. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, the electricians on the movie sets, they all have cataracts. Yeah, isn't that because interesting? They've been looking into those big yeah. lights for so many years. Oh, yeah. uh, this is from Vincent. Can you develop an immunity to Lyme disease after having it once? Or is it more likely to come back after you've had it once? Yes and no. You're going to have antibodies for the rest of your life to show that you've been infected, but you can be reinfected. And sometimes if people have had Lyme disease, they can sometimes get a second kick of it. Uh. Sometimes people get Lyme disease and they get arthritis and a little something or a little fever and it goes away. Other people I've seen, it really can attack their brain and they get a fogginess and they feel like they've never really gotten their lives back. So it's one reason why if when I'm out and I'm in tick country, I pull my socks up over my clothing, light pants, light socks, DEET, and then do a tick check afterwards. I think ticks are frightening. I read somewhere that this is a very heavy... Connecticut. Yeah, very heavy season it this is. season. It is, and because we are so much warmer, we've had so much rain, the right. entire United States is like off season this mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. There are more ticks than ever. This is from Pat. How important is it being a part of a community for a person's health? I've heard that it contributes to longevity. I think community is everything when it uh -huh. comes to health. And we know that even family members, friends, distant um, relationships on the web, on the phone, via Skype, you can keep each other healthy. And that if you're losing weight, I don't care how far away that buddy is, that person could be in the Middle East. When you have someone to share your sorrows with, the good times, the bad, talk about your food diaries, what you're weighing, what your stresses are, it all works. Community really? matters. I think community is the core of it all. And some people say having a pet also. Oh, we know that's for sure. Is it for sure? People who have pets have healthier immune systems, live longer. Probably it has to do with the amazing love that an animal gives you back, but also that animal dander keeps your immune system revved really? up and healthy. Oh my god. A gosh. dog can save your life. Wow. Yep. This is from Gretchen. Oh, Gretchen, this is the question of all time. What can I do about mm. my stress? I think I'm in the same boat as a lot of women, husband, kids, work. My stress levels are high and joyful activities seem out of reach. Please give me some advice. So I think this is the one thing that women underestimate. So you're ahead of the game. I think we all think we can handle it all and our stress levels are fine and this is just normal. Problem is, when you're under stress and there's no end in sight, your stress chemicals go up and that makes you reach for sugar, 
carbohydrates, fat, you put on five or 10 pounds, alcohol. you feel more stressed, you reach for alcohol, you self-medicate, right. and then it starts that very vicious cycle. So number one, run away from home. Find some, tell your husband, he's got the kids for the weekend, meet two girlfriends, run away, check out, and recommit to yourself. No one will take care of you like you will take care of you. This is not selfish, it's self-preservational. Yes, it so tell your kids you love them, tell your husband you love him, and get out of there, and figure out what you need to do to put your life back on course. What about a massage? Massage. I mean, that helps Walk me. in the park. Yeah. A movie with somebody. Right. Something you haven't given right, yourself. Right. But the mind-body connection has to be restored on a very personal level. When I'm under a lot of stress, I go to a comedy club. Perfect. I have to laugh. Perfect. I'm laughing. I'm not upset. Uh, this is from Rosie. I have a friend that has terrible halitosis. He's so mm. cute. But the minute he starts talking, I want to run away. What can you suggest to help him? Sometimes adults who have bad breath have one of two things. Either tonsils that they didn't have taken out as kids, and their tonsils oh. are sort of rotting. Oh. And an adult tonsillectomy can many times get big, take care of bad breath. And sometimes people have bacteria in their stomach, and they're breathing up the, um, the air uh, or regurgitating the air in their stomach. But the first thing I would do is go see an ear, nose, and throat doctor and have my mouth looked at. Uh -huh. It can be a bad tooth, sinus infection, tonsils, or an upset stomach. Great. Uh, oh, this is a good question. This is from Sandra. Mm. Are statins the only solution to high LDL cholesterol? No. Diet and exercise, number one. Right. So you can, the LDL is your bad cholesterol. We now know that high levels of HDL, the good cholesterol, may not protect you against heart disease, but high levels of LDL can get you into trouble. So I would first of all try diet and exercise and see if you can bring it down. If statins can't be tolerated, then there are some other things that are even, I, I won't say more remote, but more high tech. There, I was at the University of Pennsylvania not too long ago, and they have a ward for people who have really dangerously high levels of LDL. They can't tolerate medications, and they literally draw your blood out, take all the fat out, put your blood back in wow. your body. I'd never seen anything like wow. it. But the statins are really pretty darn good. So if you haven't tried them, talk to your doctor about them. They may prevent not only heart disease, but some cancers. You know, you can get out. I had a, a high cholesterol, and my doctor went through my diet. Mm -hmm. And he said, stop eating lamb chops three times a oh, week. Oh, you know what mine, your mine was? Unfiltered coffee. Oh, really? I love European coffee. And I said, I, no matter what I do, I can't get my cholesterol down. We went through everything. And they said, what kind of coffee do you drink? And I said, oh, this wonderful unfiltered European coffee. He went, no, all the oil's on the top. Right. If I drink filtered coffee, I'm fine. See? So but it's I mean, some, usually something yeah, in your diet. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you get rid of it. And, yeah, so I, now you're down to lamb chops once I, a week? Yeah, once a week. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm Lebanese. We, I know. We were raised on lamb. <laughs> I mean, lamb is our beef. We just eat it all the time. Anyway, Harriet wants to know, there seems to be some controversy mm. over prostate screening guidelines. And what do you think about PSAs? So PSA test is a blood test, which yeah. specs, checks for an antigen. It's very sensitive and can go up in men with cancer, inflammation, benign tumors. The problem is it's not specific for prostate cancer. So government guidelines recently came out and said, not a good screening tool. But since I reported that, I have gotten a lot of pushback from people who said, wait a minute, it saved my life. Urologist has said it's the only great test we have. So for a man 50 and over, some people are still arguing that it should be used at least once to get an idea of a number, but increasingly, Doctors are going to recommend a prostate exam, digital prostate exam, where a finger goes up the rectum, the doctor feels the prostate, checking for lumps. Then if there's a lump, that lump gets biopsied. Uh -huh. But the test is not great. That's what I've heard, too. Uh, Connie wants, says, I'm a breast cancer survivor, and I'd like to know if there are any soy products that I can use, since I'm not supposed to have any soy. I'm... ER. Estro yeah, estrogen receptor positive. I see. Yep. And so in people with breast cancer, if they have this receptor ER positive, it means they are susceptible to estrogen. And there are sort of some products that are thought to maybe increase more estrogen and put you more at risk for breast soys. cancer. So I think the jury is out on that. Uh -huh. um, not every doctor believes that eating soy products uh, is really going to harm you. And a lot of people, you know, like soy products. Um, what's the stuff? Uh, I can't stand tofu. it. Tofu. Ugh, 
I hate it. I, I, some people love it. I put it myself. So yeah, so some people love tofu because it's low calorie, high in protein, and has natural soy. I'm not so sure that eating that's going to hurt you. Oh, good. Uh, I know we're running out of time, but I've got so many questions. So let me just put, throw in a few more. This is from Lacey. There are so many strengths of SPF and sunscreen. What's the best level to get? Minimum 15 or 30. Anything over that is a marketing tool. Really? Well, yeah. if it's 100, don't do it. Oh, waste of money. Really? Yeah, 30 is fine. See there? This has got our <laughs> money's worth today. Uh, this is from Amy. I've always had problems with irregularity. Is fiber the answer? If so, how much? Are there supplements or foods? So not everybody is supposed to poop every day. This whole <laughs> idea of irregularity is sort of crazy. Maybe you poop three times a week. <laughs> Maybe you poop two times a week. Not everybody poops every day. So once you know what you are, you can get over this term of irregularity. But fiber, fiber, fiber is the tool for anything and lots of water. So every slice of bread should have at least two grams of fiber. Eat cereal every day, sometimes twice a day. Right. Great fiber, cuts down on eating other calories, and it's fortified with all kinds of nutrients. And lots of water. And Most flax people are seed, right? Flax seed's good. Yeah. Most people who are constipated are dehydrated. Oh, really? Just drink water. Huh. I always thought people that were constipated were uptight. Yeah, and, and boring and like just sense of humor. <laughs> this, <laughs> not us. We're not constipated. This is, I'm not. <laughs> this is from Susanna. I'm interested in natural remedies. I need holistic answers to having early onset of osteoarthritis. What do you think? Well, I believe in holistic medicine. I, you know, I used to live in California where I learned from my patients that good integrative medicine is the best of the west and the best of the east mm -hmm. so if you have early arthritis and you want to ward it off and you don't want to be on the fancy arthritis medicines walk 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 use every arthritic joint you have get m massage get stressed get ac i mean stretched get um acupuncture or acupressure all of those things work together the more you blend mind-body when you have early arthritis, the more you're going to be able to cope and minimize the pain. Are there foods that you should not eat when you have arthritis? Some people think dairy causes them problems. I don't think it's foods. I really think it's baby aspirin, which are fine, which can reduce the inflammation. How many and then a day? using that joint. One a day is fine. I take two baby aspirin a day for stroke. Anything. And... I would say one baby aspirin up to three or four is fine. Uh -huh. Okay, but good. use those joints. A lot of times when joints hate, I went, a lot of times when joints hurt, people stop using them because they think it hurts more. Wrong thing. Use them more. And if it's a joint that hurts when you're walking down the street, get in a swimming pool. Yes, I have a girlfriend that does yeah. that. Uh, this is from Pamela. Does Sensa really help a person lose weight? I need to lose 100 pounds. So everyone's racing to figure out the chemistry of the brain, the new leptin, and how you can interfere with a pathway that makes you crave foods. No great medicine is out there that's going to be a magic bullet for you. I, you know, it's, it's, it's where every pharmaceutical company is racing, but there's nothing perfect out there. Aren't there those drinks that fill you up? There's drinks that fill you up. Most of the medications, though, that trick your brain into thinking that you're full have serious side effects. So you would never, ever, ever take these medications without being under the aegis of a really smart weight loss doctor. Uh -huh. I mean, someone who really specializes in obesity. I'm getting the hook here, but there, there's a few more, because the people really need to know these things. And this is a good question. This mm -hmm. is from Diana. Are there any new methods or aids to help me quit smoking? Cigarettes are more addictive than heroin. So wow. it's very easy for those of us who don't smoke to say we should just quit. So first of all, decide that you don't want to die. Figure out something like your child's wedding, a grandchild's graduation from high school, something you know you want to live for, and that is the reason to throw them away. Pick a date, <coughs> kazoon tight. Pick a date, pitch them, and then put that community of support around you. Figure out your stressors. If you like a beer and a cigarette, throw the beer away. Start to revamp your life around the things that don't involve a cigarette. It's what doable. A, what and about the gum? Nicorette gum, Nicorette um, patches, acupuncture, all of those things together. Those and good. you can use them all together. Nicotine is just the thing that addicts you and brings you into the tent. It's the chemicals in the cigarettes that kill you. So if you're on nicotine for the rest of your life, I'm fine with that. I just don't want you to smoke. Right. Uh -huh. Nicotine's fine. The reason people like cigarettes too is it makes your brain feel smarter and you get a little boost of energy. The nicotine alone will do that. Oh, so the gum. Yeah. The gum and a patch. You can use it at so the same time. So it's the time. smoke that's killing you. It's the smoke that kills you. Uh, this is from Lauren. July 4th is coming up, and I've heard that alcohol and sitting in the sun 
is a terrible combination. Is that true? Alcohol doesn't make the sun work more. Alcohol just makes you disinhibited so you forget to put on your sunscreen again and you make bad decisions. But alcohol and the sun alone, they don't cause trouble. Oh, really? You just, you just get dopey and when it may, you're yeah, drunk. Yeah, it makes you sleepy. Yeah, you have yeah. one then beer you fall, in the sun exactly. and you're sound asleep. This is from Amy. Where can I get more information on lupus and why is there only one drug specifically developed for lupus. Do you know of any others? I think until recently, lupus, lupus has been seen as sort of a, um, an orphan illness and not enough money and research has gone into it. The Lupus Foundation is one of the best resources around for information, support groups, things you can do to make your life easier. Lupus is an autoimmune illness. It can be managed. It's tough. It hits women primarily, usually with arthritis and rashes, sometimes depression. And it's tough. It's a whole lifelong change. But check with the Lupus Foundation. They've done the most extraordinary work of anybody out there. Oh, great. Okay, this is our last question, I promise. But we just, th these are such important questions. This is from Stacy. And because obesity is such a big problem, right. as we know, the First Lady is really working on it too. Stacy says, Do you have any tips for parents talking to their teens about health and nutrition without worrying their teens about their weight? Too many young girls are already very obsessed with their weight. So, how do you have this conversation without turning them into, you know, Yeah, we, have, we do extremes. We have yeah. the anorexics and we have the morbidly obese. We right. seem to sort of forget the middle of the road, and most of life is played between the 40 yard lines. It's not to have the perfect body. You want a strong, healthy body. I mean, right. you want to grow up thinking, you know, you can lift those weights. You can walk a mile and a half. And I would argue that by the time girls are preteens, it's too late. These are the conversations you start having with two and three and four-year-olds. I'm a big believer in sit-down family dinners. That's where you, nutrition is set. That's where kids learn to eat other foods. Introduce, introduce ethnic cuisine. Let kids know that when the kitchen's closed after dinner, the kitchen's closed. This is it. And introduce all kinds of things that you wouldn't think a child would like, but if they put it on the table, they will. And then talk about health, 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 not skinny, skinny, skinny. Well, what do you do if you have a teen and you're worried that she's going to be either obese or anorexic? How do you start to introduce that? I mean, you, you didn't do it when she was two. So Sports. Now uh -huh. I'm a big believer that Sports for girls teach them to honor their bodies. And uh -huh. you can't be good in athletics if you don't eat the right kinds of foods. Uh -huh. Most of the time that kids are either anorexic or obese in high school is because nobody's sitting down and having family dinners. Right, yeah. they're, you know, they're grabbing food on the run and they're eating in the car. Right. Or mom's fixing four dinners for four different kids. Right. Nobody has conversations. Uh -huh. When you have to sit across the table and have a conversation mm -hmm. with somebody and you're all sharing the same food, you know you grew up like oh, that. Right. Yeah, we it did. changes everything. Right. Yeah. That's a, it's a huge paradigm shift mm -hmm. for families to recognize the family dinner table is as much about conversation as it is anything else. And that's where you can bring yeah. those things up. But gently, it's not to scold. It's to introduce strength and health and wellness as part of a, na a family tradition. Uh -huh. That's great advice. We're so out of time. I mean, we are completely, <laughs> they're going to throw us off the network. But there's so darn many questions and there's still a lot more. But I really wanted to get the ones that I thought more people than than not would really be interested in. Thanks, Thank you. Mama. You're so good. Oh, You're so big smart. Fun. Thank you. Such fun. She looks so great. Don't we all want to look like this? <laughs> Come back. We'll see you next Monday. And I hope Nancy comes back soon. I'd love that. Good. Thank you.